I would love to hear um, some of your nightmare stories that you could share with our listeners. So it, it's funny that you should talk about nightmare because I'm actually semi in the midst of one and just kind of finished it. And it, and it crosses over a couple of different areas of my practice. So it, it may take a little time, but I, I think people will get the gist of what's going on. Basically, there were four siblings that owned a home, three of whom were never married one of whom was married, and eventually the house was owned by A, B, C, and D and D's husband. D and D's husband die, and by operation of law, their daughter basically inherited that house. There was no will. We didn't have to do an administration proceeding because real property transfers by operation of law to the next of kin. She was the only child, and so ultimately she ended up with the house, with the quarter of the house, I should say. So now we have A, B, C, and E, if you will, the niece of A, B, and C as the owners of the house. And A dies. A dies with a will, and that's how I kind of got involved. E, the niece, was the executor named in the will. And so I petitioned the court. I get her appointed. She is appointed. And now she has to make a decision of what are we doing? Well, the decedent only owned 25% of the house. She owned 25% of the house. And the aunt and uncle owned 25% each, and they were still alive, and they were living in the house. And there, by the way, there was a reverse mortgage on the house. So, and the aunt and uncle were elderly in their 80s, if not 90s. And so she didn't want to sell the house and kick them out. It was always the intention that this house was going to be there until they were no longer alive. So we kind of just sat on it. She was appointed, and we didn't do anything. We didn't do any transfers. B and C continued to live in the house. The reverse mortgage kept coming out. B and C were living on that, and all was good for a couple of years. As B and C were getting older and older and older. Unfortunately, in the midst of all of this, the niece actually passed away. And the niece, as you know, was appointed executor of the uncle's estate. The niece was married and had children and lived in Connecticut. So we had to do a proceeding in Connecticut for her husband to be appointed executor of her will in Connecticut, okay? In her will, she left her share of the house to the her two children. In New York, we had to do what's called an ancillary proceeding because there was property in New York that she owned. So after the husband was appointed in Connecticut, we then do a, a proceeding in New York whereby the husband now gets appointed as the ancillary executor of her estate in New York. So now we have that proceeding of his estate, but now we still have the uncle that she was the executor of. Then we have to go back and look at his will and see who his successor executor is. That's basically second in charge. That happened to be the niece's son, the great nephew. So then I get retained by him, and we do a proceeding to have a successor executor appointed. So now he's the successor executor of the uncle, the husband is the executor of the aunt, and we still have B and C alive, continuing to get older and older and older. The nephew gets to the point where they're very old, the house is becoming dilapidated, he wants to get them closer to them, he also has power of attorney, they have wills, the whatnot, they get moved to be closer to him and we enter into a contract of sale for the house as successor executor and as ancillary executor being still still alive they are 97 and 101 in the midst of our contract unfortunately one of them died and so that put the entire contract on hold in the midst of covid and i had to do emergency letters to get the nephew who was the executor in B's will appointed. And luckily the court, the Kings County surrogate did a great job. They, they, they looked at my letter, my request for urgency, and I did get him appointed fairly quickly, although there were a lot of nuances with that because it was a Connecticut resident at the time. And so we had to get a New York state tax affidavit waiver and things, but it eventually got done and we actually did not lose the real estate deal and the transaction closed on Monday. And so I was very excited that we were able to do that. And, and that was a situation where there was a lot of moving pieces and a lot of moving parts. And we just, you know, we needed to get this, this house sold because 
the bills were racking up, the real estate taxes weren't being paid, the reverse mortgage was getting higher and higher, and, and we just needed to get rid of it. And, and so that, that was probably my most newest nightmare story, if you will.